Hi everybody, I wanted to go over the uh, new wave booklet. Um, this is uh, this booklet shouldn't take us too much time because a lot of these concepts is already covered in um, the second booklet. So if you remember, the second booklet dealt with um, it dealt with the property of sort of waves, um, and uh, you know there we discussed. Um, so there was, it was the first booklet, sorry. The first booklet discussed, um, you know, what reflection was, what refraction was, diffraction, standing waves. All those concepts were covered in, in, that, um, in that first booklet. Um, and, and this booklet here, this, um, this booklet on the ray model of light, uh, this one deals with um, performing the calculations for those concepts. Um, so as long as we, we revise that booklet before we get into this book, um, we should be fine. But all in all, there should be a summary of all the concepts in this booklet, so it shouldn't be some steep buy-in um, in your learning. Okay, let's have a look at this. So this is the general inquiry question for the Ray model of light. So it says, what properties can be demonstrated using the Ray model of light? So if we, I guess, reflect back, sorry for the pun, um, on what... Um, how we represent light. We we're talking about light being represented as sine waves. And um, we talked about how those sine waves can be looked at from a bird's eye view, looking like um, like sea waves, where the, the actual lines represent um, the crest and the white in between is the trough. So what happens is if we um, model as a, if we model a um, perpendicular line threading through all those lines as being a ray, then we can treat those those um, those waves as rays. And we talked about how that's important to describe some of these laws, like um, the law of reflection, where the angle that um, incidence with respect to the normal equals the same angle that it reflects as out. Uh, so it reflects out with respect to the normal. Okay, we talked about that. Um, and we talked about the inverse square law relating to sound, right? And it's exactly the same equation here, except we're using it to discuss light. Light follows that same idea. So it follows that same principle, that inverse square law. So if you had some kind of um, intensity of light at this position um, and some intensity of light at that position, the light at here, at this position, at about three times the distance from the center, um, is going to be dimmer uh, with respect to that area that it's got to cover, right? Okay. Um, here's some examples. We've actually walked through these examples before um, using this um, uh, equation. But one of these actually is very important that we'll go over. So we'll go over each one of these explicitly. All right. So I'm going to switch cameras. Okay, so hopefully my camera comes out quite good. But um, let's get some of these values down. Okay, okay so it says, the light from a 25 watt compact fluorescent light bulb has an intensity of 11 candelas, right? At a distance of one meter. Um, calculate the intensity of the light at a distance of two meters. So we want to know what will be I2 at two meters. Okay. Now they've given us this other value here. It's telling us it's got a power of 25 watts. And we could probably use that as well. Um, but that's not really what we want to be exercising here. We want to be working with this expression um, because well, it comes up a lot. So we get good at it. And a lot of the equations follow that same form. If we get good at that, um, 
then our life becomes a lot easier. Right? Another way that we could do it is, um, well, I haven't included that expression yet, and that's fine. But it comes up in one of your, your questions. So let's do this, okay. So I1 is 11, D1 is one squared. So that comes down to 11. Um, I2, we don't know. D2 squared is two squared. Um, so we get I2, four. So we get I2 is equal to 11 divided by four. Okay. And that's the setup they got here, which is 2.75 candles. Right? Is equal to point two. Okay, no worries. But this one here is a bit more different. This one kind of expects you to do a little bit of thinking here. So this one says um, the distance between a compact fluorescent light bulb and the observer is doubled. Okay, so here we have to come up with some, I guess, they're not fake values, they're proportion values in order to solve this problem. This is a, a good place to kind of um, get good at because this is where a lot of the HSC questions kind of um, hit at. Okay, so they don't, they don't want you to, they don't give you intensity, they just want you to predict what the intensity would be um, if you doubled, um, so it was double the distance, was it? Yeah, okay. So we have I1 is some kind of value, I2 is some kind of arbitrary value as well. We're not too concerned about those values, but we know um, D1 has got some value of 1. And D2 is equal to twice D1. Twice D1. That's the key thing here. So we've gone from using, um, using explicit numbers to using proportions. We're saying that D2 is twice the distance of D1, right? And D1 is equal to 1. Um, D1 could be equal to any value, but here it's equal to one, right? So let's do that. Um, but, <clears throat> okay. Yes, D1 is equal to, to one. Um, but in this instance, because we're just expressing it as, as a term, we can forget about that value, right? right? So we can set up this expression. So I1 stays like that. D1 um, squared stays like that. Um, that's fine. Um, I2 stays like that, but D2 no longer looks, looks like that. It looks like this. It looks like 2D1 squared. Okay. So we'll distribute that square across. So that's like writing this. 2, um, two squared. Uh, D1 squared. So now this looks like that. I1 D1 squared is equal to I2 4 uh, D1 squared. Okay. We can divide both sides by D1 squared. So we cancel this side, we cancel that one. And we end up getting um, I1 is equal to um, 4I2. And the question was asking us, um, how much will the intensity of light change? Okay. So we know that 
I2 is four times the intensity of I1, but that's not what we want to find out. What we want to find out is that um, okay, so we divide this side by four, divide this side by four, cancel this four out, and I end up getting I2 is a quarter of the strength of I1. Okay, so rather than using any numbers, we've used proportions and we used ratios to to calculate that problem, uh, to answer that problem. So see how that worked out. Um, hopefully that makes sense to you. All we've done is rather than use numbers, we've used uh, multiples of different terms to answer this. Okay, we'll do more practice of these because these are quite popular um, when it comes to our HSC. Okay, let's move on. Uh, okay, mirrors. We've spoken a fair bit about um, plane mirrors, um, and uh, we've talked about them in the context of uh, the law of reflection. So, um, if, as you've got some kind of light that hits that mirror, it's going to bounce off at that, um, you know, reflected angle, which is equivalent to the um, angle of incident. Um, the only one that with the only two mirrors that we're going to look at in this course, and not really in that much detail, are these um, these curved mirrors. And the way that we're modeling them is that we're treating them as if they were perfect circles, right? So if you had some perfect glass disco ball that you know wasn't composed, we wouldn't be able to wouldn't be a glass disco ball, but it'll be just some some kind of glass. Uh, sorry, some kind of um, uh, chrome um, sphere, and you cut that sphere in half. Then these are what these shapes would represent. And what happens is um, you have two types. You have things that converge, which um, mean they come together. Con meaning coming together, um, and you've got things that diverge, which um, you know go away from each other and spread out. So what they're saying is what they're saying is with um these these um convex mirrors, um with converging mirrors, you have the hollow face facing you. And what happens is as that light comes and hits that um uh, uh, that that surface, that curved surface, all the lights follow the, the law of reflections and they um actually uh, point at some point, they all end up pointing at some point where they all meet and intersect. Um, and we call that point the focus. The thing about um, um, the diverging ones, the ones where you're um, shining a light on the outside of that surface, is that you do have, I guess, a virtual point where those um, lights would have met um, if if these weren't mirrors and they were glass, they would have actually occurred behind the, the, the curved surface, and that would have been our focus point. We say that's a virtual focus point because we can't see it. Because in reality, as you shine that light to that surface, they bounce away because they diverge, and they bounce at an angle that is um, explained by the law of reflection. The other key thing about this is that um, Every circle, with respect to its circumference, it should have a radius. That radius um, is an interesting number because that radius, half of that radius value is going to give us the focal point of that circle. So here, that focal point here says that that's half the distance that the radius of that circle would be. So about this distance, that would be the radius. Sorry, that would be the, the centermost point of that, um, whoops of that circle. So um, <clears throat> that's an interesting property there as well. Okay, lenses. Again, we're not going to do many calculations. I mean, there's this equation here, remember if it's in white, um, it's not that that important. It probably won't come up in your exam. Um, <clears throat> but uh, moving on to lenses, uh, we're just going to look at two lenses. And if you know how to name them, um, and what they do, whether they converge and diverge, that's that's all we kind of really need to know for this. So let's have a look at that in more detail. Um, 
Okay, um, here we are. So if you if you remember the the mirrors, when it had a hollow facing the light or some kind of um, dip, think of it as a cave where the light was entering, then we said that that was a concave mirror. Now with the lenses, it's the same principle. It's you've got that hollow facing the light that's um, hitting it, and we say that's a concave lens. But unlike um, the mirror, the the light doesn't converge. The light actually diverges, but you still have that imaginary um, virtual focus that occurs. So we say these ones um, are concave mirrors, right? Um, and they make sense. We've been talking about diffraction. So what happens is you can see, I say you had some kind of focal point or focal length. As that um, mirror, sorry, as that lens makes its way to a ray, uh, just before it hits it, it's straight. And once it hits it, it's got to behave in a manner which respects the law of refraction. So it's almost like it's coming in and then it's being refracted back out um, uh, through the lens. But this one gets extra refracted because it's got its normal bend and you know normally would just exit, but because it actually hits the end, it gets um, further refracted. Let's follow that beam. Um, you can see it starts to straighten out from that to there, and that's its actual proper refraction that, it, that uh, it would experience. Okay, now converging lens, um, but these these are, are like the convex um, mirrors, which, um, <clears throat> which, which have a, I guess, a, um, a surface that is pushing against the light that's hitting it. Um, and we call these um, convex mirrors. Um, now again, but this one interestingly, because um, what happens is the virtual, in, in the mirror, the mirror version, we have a virtual, um, a focal point of the light but um, in this instant the actual lights coalesce and, and meet at that fine point behind uh, the mirror um, but it's still doing the same property which is uh, bending that light as it enters that lens right so um, yeah so normally the mirror would hit that light and bounce it off um, and diverge it, but here it actually converges it, but it's still known as a convex lens. Um, so um, that's why the names can be a bit of a misnomer. Um, well, in this one you can see, because it's got that slight, um, I guess, angle, uh, you, you would imagine that as that light hits that, um, you know, curved area, bent area, that the light would refract, right? It's almost like that light is being forced to fall at that weird angle. And once it falls at that weird angle, it actually, um, once it passes through that lens, it gets refracted um, into that, um, into that angle, which converges all the light to that one single focus, uh, focal point. Okay, um, very good. These questions, um, I will go over, uh, I'll go through them online with you guys. So have a go at those questions yourselves. You should be quite good. Uh, this is a bit of a um, class from the past, this expression, because remember how we were talking about how um, sound, sorry, light behaves exactly as sound, it follows that inverse square law. In that previous booklet that I gave you guys about sound, I presented this expression about how sound is is um, expressed as power, which is the amount of energy 
passed them through some kind of through some kind of um, squared area. Um, so that was intensity, but power had to do with the amount of energy passing through a particular point in a certain amount of time. And what happens is because we treated um, sound as some kind of uh, three-dimensional field that propagated outwards, uh, by dividing the surface the surface area of that field, it would give us the value of the power. Uh, sorry, the value. Yeah, well, I guess the value of the power in that um, in that uh, particular region, that particular area, and that happened to be the definition of intensity. So make sure you you go back to your other booklets to help you answer with this question. Um, but you should be quite fine with that. Okay, and here we get into refraction. Okay, so we're back to refraction. We know that refraction has to do with um, uh, the bending of light as it enters different mediums. And the, why, the reason why it bends is because of the, the, the yeah, the density of the viscosity, really the density of the medium. So we normally treat air as um, a value of one, being the value of a vacuum, but it's not necessarily the case. It's really something like 1.0000022 or something, which is the refractive index of air. But we normally treat it as a value of one, just to simplify calculation. So um, remember, as that light comes and it hits um, that boundary, and say here we've got medium two being um, more dense, what happens um, as that enters into that denser medium, it bends towards the normal. But if the light was going from, from say, when I say water into air, because um, it's exiting a denser medium and entering a lighter medium, it doesn't refract towards the normal, it refracts away from the normal. So if you remember those two conditions, that's gonna help you a lot um, when it comes to analyzing these problems. Okay, refractive index. Let me show you what refractive index is about. Refractive index has to do with, um, I mean, it says it here, it's a ratio of the different in speed between the mediums and you're and you're always comparing it to um, uh, what the speed of light would be in a vacuum so remember c is equal to speed of light which is not two times ten to the power of eight it's three times ten to the power of eight sorry um, okay so let's have a look at that Okay, so it looks like this. Um, if you had some kind of, you had some kind of light, and let's say we were going from air, medium air, and then medium that we're going to enter is say water. Okay, now we've got some of these values already given to us here for refractive index. We're saying that water has a refractive index of one point three three. Okay. Um, so what happens is we shine that line through it, um, that's okay, we know it's refracting and that's alright, but that's not what we're after, what we're after is the speed of that. So we know the speed of light in, in a vacuum is 3 times 10 to the power of 8, or it's equal to one value of the, or one whole value of the speed of light. Now if we look at what's happening in this medium of water, um, it's no longer going at one value of the speed of light. It's going at 75% of the speed of light. Um, so we can do that. We can do it. We can use just those values, but just to prove the, co um, the concept, um, I'll do the whole calculations and I'll show you. So if I divide, um, if I'm trying to solve for, the refractive index of water. The refractive index of water, and that's going to be equal to uh, one times the speed of light, times 10 to the power of eight, divided by 0 0.75, the speed of light, because these two values are the same, we can cancel them out, but we'll do the whole, the whole step just to um, prove the concept, okay. Uh, 
Okay, there we go. So 75% of um, the speed of light is that. When you divide them together, we find out that the refractive index is 1.33. And it doesn't have a new um, a value, sorry, a unit. It's just, um, it's, it's weird. It's, it's, not, it's a constant, so that's why it doesn't have a value. Okay, so that's the refractive index. Now what happens is um, they all, all refractive index should be greater than one. One is the value of light in a vacuum. So diamond, silicon, all those have a higher value. So you can see diamond here has a value of 2.42 um, in refractive index. Okay, so I've just kind of demonstrated that. So this should be all good. Um, that's the same one actually. And uh, we'll move on to this uh, uh, Snell's law. Uh, Snell's law is is explaining um, is explaining refraction, and it's actually trying to calculate how the refraction is related to the medium. And um, we don't need to know how to derive the expression, but um, it it draws from this idea that all all angles of incidence and angles of refractions that occur are related to each other by by um, right angles and proportions of those angles right and those proportions of those angles are related by the medium so a lighter medium so a less denser medium um, will be larger than um, you know, the more denser medium. So you can swap these around. You can maybe lift this one as water and convert the top one into a glass. So you can see once they've got to water here, it's a straight line because it's just going a straight line. It's not entering a different medium. But as you, as you uh, make that medium from the source more denser, it's no longer bending towards the normal it's bending away from the normal because it's more dense. And then it gets to this weird point, some weird angle where um, it actually just bounces back in, right? It goes at 90 degrees and bounces back in. And we'll talk about that. It's called to, um, internal reflection. Okay, so, um, right, the other thing about this expression about Snell's law is that um, it's got, you know the values of of the of the it's got the refractive index of the different mediums yeah that's fine and it's also got the incident angles and the ref, the refracting angles in the different mediums so it's it's just the angle of motion of the light in the different mediums so medium one whatever angle it's it's um, moving into the it, it's connecting to the sorry it's its angle that it's experiencing to the normal, and at medium two, what angle it is experienced towards um, towards the normal um, in that medium. So it's quite a, it, it looks a bit overwhelming, the expression, um, but it's the same thing that we've been using here, right? It's using ratios, right? Ratios of two values. Um, looks very similar to that except you've got a trig um, function uh, attached to it. But we'll do a couple of, we'll do an example here. Well, there's two examples here, I think. So we'll go through those examples. I will only have one example, um, and that should, should kind of clear things up a bit. Uh, so let's do this one together. All right, it says, using Snell's law, a ray of light, um, sorry, ray of light, in air strikes the surface of a pool, okay? It's telling us um, that the refractive index of um, water is equal to 1.33. And it does this at an angle of 30 degrees. So that's theta water is equal to 30 degrees um, to the normal. Calculate the angle of refraction of the light in water. So it wants us to make that assumption that the refractive index um, of 
light, oh, sorry, of air, is equal to one. It wants us to make that assumption. And it wants us to find the angle, the incident angle of, um, of the light in the air, okay? Calculate the angle of refraction of the light in the air. Sorry. The ray of light strikes the surface of the pool of water at an angle, sorry. So we want to know the refracting angle in water and we have the angle in air. Perfect, no worries. So this looks like this, right? This is our setup. We got our knowns. We know that the refractive index of water is 1.33. We know that the angle that the light hitting the, the boundary water in air. We know that um, it's coming at 30 degrees in air. Um, and then because it's going into a denser medium, right? We know that it's not going to bend this way. It's got to bend more closer towards the normal. Right? So it's going to be a small angle. We know that. And that's going to be theta water. That's what we're figuring out. Okay, so let's let's put this to to um to test, right? So we've got n one sine theta one is equal to n two, the refractive index of medium two, times the sine of the angle of um, refraction or the light bending in medium two. So we will call this one n um, a. <coughs> That's going to be sine theta air. That's going to be n water. And that's going to be sine theta water. That's what we're trying to figure out. So we know we know a lot of these. We know that's one. We know that's going to be sine um, thirty. We know that the refractive index of water is 1.33, but we don't know this. That's what we're trying to figure out, sine theta water. Okay, so let's do that. Um, one times sine 30 is 0 0.5. Uh, divide this side by 1.33, divide this side by 1.33, we get 0 0.5 divided by 1.33 is equal to sine theta water. Simplify that a bit more. We get um, zero point three seven six is equal to sine theta water. Um, now, the way we get rid of sine from this side and on that side is that we take the inverse of it. So inverse here cancels that out, and then we have to do the sine inverse here as well. So then this looks like this. Sine inverse, the power of one, 0 0.376 is equal to theta, the angle of incident of water, right? And that um, is an angle of 22.1 degrees is that angle. And that makes sense, right? 22.1, it's, 
is smaller than 30 degrees. Right, that makes sense. That makes sense. Let's have a look at what the answer was. Uh, right, okay, on the ball. Okay, so make sure you follow those steps through. It's it's quite doable. Again, it's we've been doing a lot of equations like that where it's about ratios and setting things equal to each other, different scenarios and what they're occurring between those scenarios um, and solving for the different values. You're usually given one value, you're usually given three values and you've got to solve uh, that missing last fourth value. Um, otherwise, you might have to get another equation to help you out to solve for another value. Remember, for every unknown that you have, um, you need an, an, an equation to solve it, right? So if you have two unknowns, you're going to need two equations. If you have one unknown, you're only going to need one equation. Okay, total, total internal reflection. Okay, what this is saying is that when you, when you, um, when you're in a denser medium and you're, you're trying to, you know, shoot light out of that medium into a lighter medium. Here we go from water. It could be anything. It could be water or anything, but some kind of thicker medium exiting into a lighter medium. We know that the light refracts away from the normal, rather from, uh, rather than what we understand that, um, you know, from lighter to a denser, it refracts towards. No, from a head, from a denser medium to a lighter medium, it refracts away from the normal. And what happens is at some point, you're refracting at 90 degrees, right? And we call that angle the critical angle. When you're refracting at 90 degrees at the boundary line, you're refracting at 90 degrees. And what happens is at any point beyond, beyond that critical angle where the light is incidenting between the mediums and refracting at 90 degrees, any angle be um, more than that is going to result in uh, no, no refraction and all the light is going to reflect inwards. So you can see this image here of the fish, that's what's happening there. You've got some of the light that's bouncing off the fish. Um, some of it, you know, at, so, at certain angles, it's exiting the water. The people outside of the water can see the fish. But um, at this particular instant where you're looking at the fish, the light that's bouncing off the fish um, onto the, the boundary between the water and um, the surface, uh, sorry, and the atmosphere, I guess, um, it's just reflecting back in. Total, total internal reflection is occurring. Okay, so it looks like this. Um, okay, you have to go from a denser medium to a lighter medium. So we got, we say this one is air, um, and we say that we're inside glass. That's silly. I'm gonna say we're inside water. Um, so again, so you know everything is okay. That's all right. You see that angle starts to increase. You're increasing that um, incident angle. You're increasing it. You're increasing it. That's okay. That's perfectly fine. Um, as you continue to do that, you can see that you are bending away because you're entering a lighter medium. But if you continue doing it, you are pro you, you approach that 90 degrees zone. At that 90 degree zone, I can't really reach it here. I haven't programmed it like that. Um, you're, you're um, refracting at 90 degrees right on the boundary line, right? And once you pass that point, um, only internal internal reflection happens, right? And you just, it's, it's almost like you're bouncing light off a, um, a plain mirror and just bouncing it back in. Um, you can try this with lasers at home and have it inside, um, you know, maybe bounce the light uh, through a fish tank if you have one available. If you don't, that's fine. Um, and see at what angle can you bounce it um, at the surface boundary and see if, and see if you can bounce it back inwards. Um, that's definitely something you can try with this. Um, so let's move on to this. Okay, so critical angle at 90 degrees, right? I see. Um, once you're, you're beyond that critical angle, um, it refracts back inwards. Okay, okay. so there's a little bit of a, a derivation here. You, you don't have to understand it, but I guess it helps to walk through it. So you've got your normal Snell's law expression, right? Which is um, 
the refractive index of medium one multiplied by the sine of the angle that um, the light enters the different medium with respect to the normal more is going to it's got to be equal to the refractive index of the second medium multiplied by the sine of the angle of the refracted light right so what we're saying here we can start any conditions in place to make this a calculation of that critical angle theta c right theta subscript c critical um, incident angle so um, we'll start doing that so we're saying here that the critical angle occurs that occurs when the angle of the refracted light is at 90 degrees and what happens is um, the angle of of sine 90 sorry sine to the angle of 90 degrees is equal to a value of one so because that's equal to a value of one we can dis disregard any of those values and just leave n2 uh, now all i have to do is move um, N1, which is medium, the refractive index of medium one, um, to the other side. So I divide this side by N1, divide this side by N1, and again end up get up, um, sorry, end up with this expression here. So I'm saying that the ratio of the refractive index of medium two, which is the less denser one, divided by the refractive index of medium one, which has to be the more denser one, is equal to the sign of the critical angle needed to bounce the light at 90 degrees. That's the key thing. It's not bouncing it in. No, it's the limit. It's the limit that once you've increased uh, beyond that angle, then the light will refract inwards. If you're at that angle, you're just bouncing that light at 90 degrees to the boundary. So let's have a look at this example. We've got two examples. We've got one example. Excellent. Okay. We will do this one together. Okay, let's, um, let's have a go at this. Uh, now this one's got two, two problems that it wants us to solve. It wants us to so solve this one first, which is um, they, want to they want you to calculate the angle of refraction of light as it moves from water into flint glass okay so it looks like this you've got a boundary here we will say that this is water say that this is our our normal lights coming in there it's got an angle of 36 degrees and we know that um, it's going into a denser uh, medium if it's going into a denser medium, it's going to refract away. But the question is asking us, what is the critical refraction from flint glass into water? So you've gone backwards for the second question. But the first question it says, uh, light traveling in water strikes the inter strikes the interface with flint glass at an angle. Okay. So that's all. We're on park here. So it's entering a denser medium. So we know it's not going to go this way. It's going to go that way. That angle is going to be smaller. And that's what we're doing. So we're not doing, you're not using this expression yet. We're using this one. We're trying to solve for um, uh, this angle here, theta 2. So let's do that. N1 sine theta 1 is equal to. 2 sine theta 2. We got 1.33 times sine 36 is equal to 1.65 times sine theta 2. Right. So we can simplify that. Zero point seven 
0.8 is equal to 1.65 times sine theta 2. Divide this side by 1.65. Divide this side by 1.65. We get 0 0.474 is equal to sine theta 2. Now remember the if we want to if we want to uh, change get rid of this trig function on this side and add it to that, so we have to take the inverse. So sine um, inverse sine inverse. Um, just remember, you should be able to do that on your, um, your calculator. If you just press the shift button and then you press the, the trig function, it should give you the inverse. So here, we're going to go shift, sorry, shift inverse sign, and we want to do 0 0.474. We add that there and we get a value of 28.3 degrees. So shift sign one, 0 0.474 is equal to theta two. We find out that theta two is equal to 28.3 degrees. And that makes sense, right? 36 degrees, 28.3 um, degrees, it's smaller. Okay, now you're not working all these steps. Sometimes you can skip these steps and just move on. That's fine, but here's just there for clarity. And remember, if you do that in your um, in your exams, then you give yourself opportunities to to I guess be considered to follow process to solve problems. Okay, the second part of the question is asking uh, this. So in the second part, they're saying that. You got the boundary of light, you got um, flint glass. And what happens is you got light coming in there um, at some kind of angle. I guess, um, I don't know what angle they're giving us to calculate here. What is the critical angle for light traveling from flint glass, uh, from flint glass to water? Okay, we don't we don't even need an angle. We just need the mediums, right? So let's do that. All right, we got some kind of angle critical, and we know at um, the critical angle, the light is just going to be traveling at ninety degrees, right, between flint glass and water. All right, so we can do that. The expression is this: the sine of the critical angle is equal to the value of medium 2 um, divided by the, the, the value of medium 1. So that is sine theta critical is equal to n2, which is 1.65, um, n1, which is Okay. All right, guys. Um, this this has got some problems because I spoke about N two being um, being the, the 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 medium where light is um, is entering the less denser medium, and N one being the denser medium. So I think we might have to kind of get rid of this and go back to this particular point here and define what's going on there. So if we scroll back up here, medium two, N1 is medium one, okay? And then it's got medium one. But it's also, it's also the denser medium. Denser medium. 
right? So that's why we've been confused. And I mean, if you think about it, this is N1, right? Which is the blink glass, and it's coming into N2, but it's it's, it's refract. It's not refracting it. So it's some. Um, so it be, be refracting. It's not refracting. It is refracting away from the normal, but it's refracting so much that it's um, 90 degrees from the normal. Okay, so that means n1 is equal to 1.65, and 2 is equal to 1.33. So let's do that again. Okay, so the sine of the critical angle is equal to 1.33 divided by 1.65 and that's equal to 0 0.81 and we take the inverse of the sine so we'll get Critical angle is equal to the inverse sine of 0 0.81, which gives us a value of 53.7 degrees. Okay? So just remember if we want to calculate the total internal reflection, uh, reflection of a light going from a denser medium to a denser medium to a less denser medium. Uh, we can just use the ratio of the refractive indexes. So being the lighter refractive index to that of the lighter, sorry, the, the lighter refractive index to that of the heavier refractive index. Um, and that'll give us that angle. So any angle, any, any light bouncing an angle greater than 53.7 degrees is, um, is just going to bounce in this. Uh, and, um, angle is greater than 53.7 degrees. All right. Okay. Um, we'll scroll through that. Now the dispersion of light. Okay. There, there. There's a couple of things about dispersion. We spoke about dispersion having to do with light. Um, white chromatic, um, unchromatic light hitting a prism. And what happens is when it hits that prism, the different lights that make up white light, which is the superposition of red, orange, yellow, green, blue, uh, indigo, and violet, Roy, G, B, um, when they constructively interfere with each other they destructively interfere in a matter to create white light and what happens is as that white light enters um, some kind of glass surface or even water um, at an angle it starts to slow down the the different electromagnetic waves the color waves and because they all have a different um, wavelength um, and a different frequency with respect to that wavelength, they um they get slowed down at different rates. And because they get slowed down at a different rates, they also experience a bend at a different angle. With that bend at a different angle, the results in them um, exiting either at a greater angle or at a lesser angle. So red um, gets bent less and well I guess you can remember that blue bends best, right? Blue gets bent the most um, as it gets dispersed. So that phenomena is called dispersion. But the cool thing about it is, is this. Um, it's application to rainbows. So I've got a nice little um, animation to show you guys about that. When it has been raining and the sun is behind an observer, the conditions are right for the production of a remarkable optical phenomenon, the rainbow. 
Sunlight, which appears to us as being white, is actually a mixture of several colors, the number of which is often given as seven. A prism decomposes white light via refraction, with the path of each color being bent at a different angle, the angle of which increases as we go from red to violet. Just as in a prism, a raindrop refracts the white sunlight, but its spherical shape changes the paths of the refracted rays. Light is refracted when it enters the raindrop, then reflected from the rear of the drop, then refracted again when it exits back into the air. The ultimate angle between the rays of the sun and the perceived image is around 40 degrees, but with a slight difference for each color. 40.5 degrees for violet, 42.4 degrees for red. Result, at any given moment, the observer's eye sees only one part of the light coming from each drop. Thus, for a drop that disperses all of the colors, only the red rays reach the observer's eye, and he sees only red. A raindrop that is located lower down also disperses all of the colors, but only the orange rays enter the eye. And so, as a result, the observer sees all of the colors of the rainbow, but different colors seem to come from different areas of the sky. Mathematical analysis shows us that the phenomenon thus observed is an arc of a circle, whose center lies below the horizon. Sometimes a second reflection occurs in the interior of a raindrop. In this case, one sees a second, but less bright rainbow, outside the primary one, at an angle of 50 degrees. Okay. Um. I guess, yeah, I, I mean, what you also have to think about is um, if, you, if you've taken a, a trip on a plane, you can actually see uh, when it's like been very, very rainy, um, you can see rainbows from up high or, and what they usually, they usually form a complete circle. So for, for some reason, they always form this, this circle that has to be, um, that has to subtend uh, 40 degrees. Um, from the light bouncing off it to hitting your, your eyes. So if you're high enough, you can actually see these, um, these complete, uh, complete arcs um, of rainbow. Um, and I mean, if you think about when you're looking through a camera or some kind of your glasses or something, you see some kind of like weird kind of rainbow. Well, that is a rainbow. It's just uh, the light being refracted into your eyes at a certain angle, which gives you that illusion that you can see a rainbow. Okay, guys, um, these questions, again, we'll go through them together, but make sure you have a go at them. You should be able to do these. Um, a lot of stuff about refractive index, quick calculations if you need to do, um, a graphing activity that you guys should really think about detailedly um, when you do this. Um, and then you've got this case where you have light being refracted through you. Um, three stages uh, and what you're doing is follow the instructions try and solve them it's like you're doing two problems at once i guess i'll give you a bit of a tip um, any lines parallel to some kind of a line um, angled line means that this the other side has the same angle right so if this angle is 29 degrees and these lines are parallel to this um, angled line then that means this side's going to be 29 degrees as well. And hopefully that helps you out. Um, and again, critical, critical angle questions. Um, have a go at this. You should be good with them.